Okay, as you can see here, uh, I have a couple of machines in the right side, couple and one machine in the left side, <coughs> and I am writing one terabyte of data. So let's assume two scenarios. In the first scenario, I, have, I just have one physical machine, which has four IO channels, that means four hard disks. Each channel has 100 Mbps speed. So let us say that you are storing one terabyte of data in this single physical machine, okay? When I store this data in this machine with this capacity, and then if I try to process the one terabyte of data in a single machine, how much time it is going to take to process that data? So there is a formula available. If you don't uh, put, I mean, if you don't, you don't need to remember the formula, just you put all these values in the formula and you will get the answer as 45 minutes with this configuration. So basically we are taking one terabyte of data and we are storing it in a single machine. And when we want to process it, it takes us 45 minutes to process that data, which is a very huge time. So what they have thought, <clears throat> let us try to divide this data and store it in multiple machines. So in the second scenario, they actually brought 10 different machines. And then of equal capacity, by the way, each machine will have four IO channels and 100 Mbps speed. Now they are distributing this one terabyte of data into multiple physical machines. You can see it like that. So, and so on and so forth. So some part of the data is stored in one machine, some part of the data is stored in another machine and so on and so forth. Now, if I want to process this one terabyte of data, which is distributed in 10 different machines, I can parallelly do that processing. So how much time I can, how, how much time it takes to process this data from this 10 machines in a parallel manner. So it would take approximately 4.5 minutes. Considering, uh, we, we, we are not considering any network transfer, network latency and all that, which will be not very huge. So approximately it comes to 4.5 minutes. So what I'm trying to highlight a point is, if you distribute your data, you can get parallel processing advantage and you can perform 10 times better than this older systems, right? Earlier case. So that is the fundamental advantage distributed file system provides. There are a lot of other advantages it provides and we will spend a lot more time on understanding the entire SDFS architecture. How does it store data? How does it process it? How does it do the failures and recovery and all that stuff? But right now, let us understand this important part, which is by storing data in a distributed manner in different machines, you will get an advantage of processing them in a parallel manner, raise your performance and decrease the processing time. That's a fundamental reason why DFS came into existence, distributed file system. Now let us understand what is DFS? What is distributed file system? <clears throat> very, very important to understand this concept. If you understand this, you understand SDFS, okay? Of course, there are a lot of details you need to understand, but if you understand this uh, stuff, which I'm going to explain right now, at least your basics of distributed file system is clear. So let's assume that there are four physical machines here, okay? And each of this machine is connected over a network. Let me just highlight it this way. So it, they, are, they are connected here over a network. everybody is connected to everyone else, right? This is part of one organization. It may be possible that one machine is in one geographical location, another machine is in another geographical location. That is possible, but they are connected over a network. Now, when we talk about one physical machine and for that matter, even your laptop can be one machine, right? Can be considered as one machine. So each machine will have its own local file system or a physical file system where you store data, right? Where you create files and folders. Normally in Windows, you, you have C drive, D drive, where you create those files and folders. Internet uses those, you know, uh, NFS file system and, and then basically stores that. But anyway, we will we'll consider that as a file system. So that's a local physical file system. Similarly, in Linux or Mac, you have slash home slash user directories under which you go and create your own folders and directories and files. So these are all local file system which is available for every physical machine, right? 
what is a distributed file system distributed file system is actually see in in this name distributed file system you have something called file system right so whenever we talk about any file system you can easily assume your you know in in case of windows you can assume your c drive d drive kind of file system which where you can go and browse any folders go inside that explore uh, different files and all that stuff but the moment you say distributed it's not physical okay so any distributed file system is actually not physical file system it is called virtual file system so let us understand this part little bit more when i'm installing hadoop now i'm talking in terms of in the context of hadoop why because of course we are going to work on that for a longer period so hadoop uses sdfs which is a hadoop distributed file system right so whenever you want to install hadoop on any machine let's say you want to make one cluster i think somebody has a question initially what is this cluster cluster is nothing but it's a set of machines connected over a network so this 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 and this these four machines are connected over a network so that becomes one cluster okay that's how we can refer a particular cluster all right so they are connected over here over the network and we are we understood that much now we were talking about the distributed file system so basically it's a virtual file system now how do we um, understand whether what is virtual file system so we all understood that every machine will have its own physical file system so whenever you want to install hadoop right say you want to install certain libraries of hadoop in every machine right ultimately it's a software so we need some libraries and some programs which needs to be installed in these machines and then we need to start them and then we we will say that yes we have installed the entire hadoop cluster right so let's assume i have installed certain programs in this machine certain programs in this machine certain programs here and certain programs here okay of hadoop and all of these programs are running as a separate processes in 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 their own uh, you know uh, environment so normally entire hadoop is written in java so these are all java processes they are running in a separate jvms in different machines they are actually creating one virtual layer which comprises of all the physical machines underneath okay this virtual layers is called dfs distributed file system okay now what happens let's understand let's say you have a file okay which is having 1 terabyte size i have a file of 1 terabyte size and i want to store this file name is let's say f1 and i want to store this file in this distributed file system so normally a distributed file system is again it's a virtual file system it's a set of programs it's a software so obviously it will have its own command which we, we can use that command to store data in distributed file system so i can as a user i can use some commands let's not worry about what command i'm using i'll just say dfs hyphen copy i'll just say source location and destination location this is the command i'm going to write the source location is the location of the file where it actually belongs right now and the destination path is a location where i am going to copy that file let's say i am creating a directory named data under root directory and under which i am going to create this file f.txt okay <clears throat> when you execute this command this entire command as a user what happens behind the scenes these programs which are running and which makes up this entire dfs they will what they will do they will first go to this source location and pick up this file divide it into multiple parts a b c and d and each of this part they will store it in different different machine a b c and d like that okay this is completely transparent to the user user is not aware whether its file is actually physically divided into four sub files this is also a file these parts are nothing but small files only which contains partial data of the original file 
okay for for us as a user we think that we have stored everything in this particular path in this location but actually behind the scenes it is distributed in multiple physical machine right now when you want to read that so what is this path then where it is present this path is not present in any of this machine this is just a virtual path and it is remembered as a metadata information that's it so when you want to read it as a user i will just refer this path i'll just say dfs hyphen cat and i'll i'll give this path this is the path i'll put it here and when i execute this command i am thinking that i'm going to read that entire one terabyte of data from a single machine from this path but behind the scenes what happens again these programs which already remembers that your file is divided into this many blocks they also remember the location of every blocks in this machines so it goes reads every block in that order right and presents the data to the user this way again it's completely transparent uh, to the user so that is how distributed file system works so it basically when you store data in dfs we think that it's a physical file system and we have loaded it in, in this physical location but this location does not present in any machine it is just virtual location physically the data gets distributed in multiple machines behind the scenes and then when we read it again it will go and read all the data from those machines and give you the data that is what we mean by dfs okay one more disclaimer here i have just given you a high level idea on dfs and virtual file system we did not understand the architecture we don't know who is controlling uh, this information whether there is any server or not whether there will be any master or not where this metadata information will be present what happens in case of one of the machine gets failed there are a lot of such stuff that we need to understand and we are going to do it in coming up sessions but i am going it step by step where i'm just explaining you some high level details so that you get familiar with that term right so why dfs uh, because let me we just discuss right that i have one physical machine if i store all 1 terabyte of data in that machine and if i want to process 1 terabyte in a single machine it will take about 45 minutes of time to do that but if the same data if i distribute it in multiple machines right using a distributed file system just the way we understood just now uh and then i can actually get a chance to parallelly process all the individual parts of this file right so i can process this 1 terabyte of data in 10 times faster time than the original use case here so that is the fundamental reason why dfs is needed because you can process that because you can store the data in a distributed manner you can increase it parallelly you can process it parallelly okay so any distributed file system is a master slave architecture by the way so we are going slowly towards you know uh, very close to what hadoop looks like so this is called one cluster cluster of five machines one machine is master others are slave okay here uh, a master as you can see here i have stored one terabyte of file so all the parts of the file are stored in slave machines master does not store any data so in any distributed file system master will just remember the metadata that means file to block mapping and block to slave node mapping which block is there with which slave node machine this is called metadata information okay this is slave node 1 slave node 2 slave node 3 slave node 4 and so on and so forth right so master will remember file to block and block to location mapping that's a metadata which is there with master for all the data that you store on as on, on a distributed file system slave will just remember the which will store the actual data okay so that means master becomes one of the very important process in this cluster who remembers the metadata and any client who wants to access the data will have to go through master only to access that data right so that's why master becomes very important there is no other way you can access data except routing through master because master only will get you the exact location where you can go and read the data 
or access the data right so master actually is a very very important process and we will also cover the scenarios like when master fails what happens how to take up the backup of masters how to take a backup of all this metadata all these things are going to be discussed in the architecture that i'm going to cover on sdfs but right now we will just understand first high level differences between hadoop and traditional system so yeah this is how the any distributed file system looks like and for that matter even hadoop is also having the same architecture master slave architecture now assume that there is a client who wants to read a file <coughs> he will go to the master because master knows the metadata and then master will tell him that this file uh, has four blocks so you can go and read it from this four machine and client will start reading it from them now during the process when it is reading the data one of the machine fails if that machine fails client will not be able to read one of one part of the file right so what does that mean that means client will get a partial data so that is a problem so during any failure of the node when we say node node is nothing but a single machine single physical machine in the cluster so any machine in the cluster is referred as one node so if one of the machine or node fails then client is not able to access data stored on that machine so what distributed file system does they actually you know uh, take care of this scenario by using a functionality called replication replication factor is basically configured when you set up the distributed file system cluster you can configure it as 2 or 3 or 4 or whatever when you configure it as 2 what happens every block will be replicated two times in the cluster okay every block every block will be replicated two times in the cluster so what happens in this case if one machine fails i can still read one of the copy of part b from other available machine right and i can read the complete data so basically this is called high availability of the data if one machine fails i can read it from other machine also this is called high availability of the data okay and that is guaranteed by uh, uh, some of the distributed file system not all hadoop guarantees that traditional distributed file system like teradata does not guarantee that why let me explain you that okay all right so now i will actually tell you one important thing which not every distributed file system is giving you guarantee in terms of uh, high availability of the data so let's understand that point little bit in detail so let me draw this first this is switch uh pardon my writing okay now this is called rack i'm sure you would have seen command center or data center in your uh uh yeah if you have seen the, the command center and data center in your company you will see that every data center or command center will have lot of racks installed right So you'll have multiple racks, and each rack will have its own machine, physical machine. You have machine one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and so on and so forth. Now each of the rack will have these physical machines installed, and they are connected over a switch to connect to the outer world. So basically, when you deploy a Hadoop cluster, right, it will not look like this. This is just for your understanding. I have shown it in this way, master and slave. But actually, physically. this is how a cluster can be seen all these nine machine together is is referred as one cluster in which are which are installed in three different rack each rack is by the way its own device and each device will have a space where you can install all these uh, machines one of them can be a master others are all slaves so let's say i have the same file let's say i have a file which is divided into multiple blocks a b c and replication factor is 3 so first of all let's assume that i'm storing my data in this fashion
Now, can you see any problem here? If I store the data in this fashion. So basically, if rack one fails, I will lose all the copies of block A. Even though I have replicated it three times and stored it in three different machines, if my rack one itself is failed, I'm still losing all the data. So this is a problem. And this problem was addressed in Hadoop. Hadoop always guarantees rack awareness, whereas traditional distributed system does not follow rack awareness. So we'll be understanding rack awareness later, uh, but right now assume that it will always guarantee that three copies of the same block cannot be installed in the three machines of the same rack. It will always be installed in two different racks or multiple machines in different racks, basically, right? So that even if one rack goes down, I will still have another copy available in another rack and then I can, you know, read the data. This is one of the, uh, you know, feature of rack awareness policy. There are other features as well, which we'll be understanding later. But I'm just explaining this because Hadoop supports this. Hadoop supports rack awareness and that's why it guarantees high availability of the data, uh, you know, even in case of rack failures. So that's why Hadoop is more reliable framework in terms of availability of the data. All right, so now let's talk about one other important difference between Hadoop and traditional systems, which is Hadoop is faster in terms of processing the data. How? So we will be understanding that. Let's say this file of one terabyte stored in distributed file system, we have A, B, C, D blocks available in four slave machines. There is a client who wants to process the data. So he will submit a program to master. I'm explaining you traditional distributed system approach, okay? How traditionally the distributed file system used to process the data first. So what in traditional systems, what they used to do, they used to follow a policy where once the program is submitted to master, master will know the locations of the input data where it is stored. So what it used to do, it used to actually transfer all the data to the machine where program is running. Okay. So basically they follow a policy where data will be transferred to the machine where computation is running, where program is running, okay? What used to happen then? It combines all the data and then program is using, going to process this data. Now there are a couple of problems with this approach. One is if I am storing, if I am processing one terabyte of data, that means I'm transferring almost one terabyte of data over a network. So it occupies a lot of network bandwidth. That is problem number one, right? then you occupy all the data in one machine and then you are going to process it. So program is going to process that data, which means you're not really doing parallel processing. First, first you occupy, occupy or bring the data from multiple sources and then accumulate it in one place and then try to process it. So that is not real parallel processing. And here we are also needing a lot more resources, CPU, RAM power to basically achieve this computation in single machine. So these are a couple of challenges with the traditional approach in terms of processing data. What Hadoop has done, it has actually done it everything in the reverse way. Okay, so Hadoop is actually sending all the computations to the machine where data is stored. So basically when the program is submitted to the master, Hadoop, instead of sending data to the machine where program is running, it does the reverse way. It sends the program to the machine where data is stored. So it does data locality uh, operations and it basically sends programs to those machines where individual block of that file is stored. So it creates multiple instances of the programs and they'll be basically sent to different machines to process that. So P1 is going to process A, P2 is going to process B, P3 is going to process C, P4 is going to process D. And all of them are parallelly processing individual block of this file, okay? And they are generating intermediate output, output one, output two, output three, output four, and so on and so forth, okay? Now, what are we doing 
here what are the advantages in this approach we are first of all avoiding entire net data transfer over a network so we are saving lot of network bandwidth we are just transferring program so it doesn't occupy much network bandwidth and we are actually doing parallel processing each blocks can be processed independently and parallelly for that file and then respective output is being generated after processing that data right now this step we are not yet done this is just an intermediate output after that what it does it actually combines all this output which is generated by every stage and it tries to merge them together and then send it to one of the machine where it runs another process called reducer which processes this data and then generate the final output okay so this is how hadoop processes the data again i have explained you a very high level overview of what hadoop does in terms of processing the data uh, we will understand it in detail when we talk about map reduce but this concept this uh, you know uh, the, the way of processing this data is referred as map and reduce so this is called map reduce and it follow one very important design pattern which is called divide and conquer so map is divide and conquer is reduce okay so divide means what you have a big problem to solve you first divide that problem into smaller chunks and then independently and parallelly process those smaller chunks first once you get the output intermediate output you combine them and then process it one more time to generate the final output that's the fundamental concept that lies behind map and reduce okay and with that concept with that approach it is actually achieving parallel processing and it is processing the data 10 times faster than the traditional distributed system so this is also one more important advantage that hadoop provides in terms of processing the data using map and reduce that also made it more faster what is exactly hadoop is it a database or not so hadoop is basically a framework which helps you to achieve two important thing we have talked about big data and we all already understood that if you want to process big data you have to first store it somewhere in a distributed manner and then you can parallelly process it so hadoop is a framework which gives you this capability it has a, a capability to store big data in a distributed and efficient way using a component called hdfs hadoop distributed file system and it has a capability to process your data once you store it on hdfs you can process it parallelly using map reduce so these two components together forms your hadoop so hadoop is a framework which gives you these two capabilities using these two components that's how you should remember the definition so that you will never forget what is hadoop okay and and you also have some of the uh, i mean one more component in latest uh, uh, this thing which is yarn latest hadoop version yarn is a cluster resource manager we'll talk about it later but yeah yarn is is a recent addition to hadoop uh, latest versions all right have a great day ahead thank you